All right. Um, so I was uh, uh, tasked with kind of reviewing the things that we've been doing in these meetings and, and at NHGRI in genomic medicine um, for the past year and a half, two years or so, just to kind of give a context for where we are and where we're going. So um, we'll do that. Uh, and just to, to mention that uh, at our May meeting, one of the topics that came up was, what do we really mean by genomic medicine? And, uh, and so we've come up with a definition that has been vetted throughout the Institute and uh, also uh, uh, with our council and, and uh, publicly. And so what we defined it as uh, was an emerging medical discipline involves genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care, such as for diagnostic or therapeutic decision making, and the other implications of that clinical use. We recognize that this is a, a narrow definition, and we made it narrow purposefully so that we could work with it within the institute. We recognize that there are departments and divisions and institutes of genomic medicine that are much broader than this, but we're really sort of focusing on the use in, in, in individual patient's care. Um, we also wanted to sort of emphasize what we meant by genomic uh, in, in our institute, but recognizing that there are much broader definitions. Um, so direct information about DNA and RNA, uh, but as we get to sort of more downstream products, they're, they're a little bit outside of our institute's immediate purview, um, recognizing that we're a small group, and so we'll kind of stay with sequence, and the further we get from that, the, the less involved we're likely to be. Um, we also recognize that the dominant proportion of our portfolio will continue to support the basic research on uh, the um, uh, uh, structure of the genome and how it functions, but we recognize we need to then stretch into these other areas. Um, and particularly, if uh, Eric uh, described our, our strategic plan um, uh, to you previously, and, and a little bit touched on it yesterday. Um, we have five main areas. The, the last two are um, um, the science of medicine and uh, uh, increasing the access to, to genomically informed healthcare. Uh, and those were, would be the two that would fit most under this uh, umbrella, recognizing that the area just before that, which is the biology of disease, is probably our, it is our biggest area of investment uh, within the institute and as well as is critical in, in forming the underpinnings of this area. Um, and we sort of view the, uh, the genomic medicine implementation or application in clinical care as a key destination um, for the basic research that the Institute will continue to su support uh, in our mission of improving health through genomics research. So, so that was sort of one output that, uh, that came out of uh, our, directly from our May meeting that we wanted to share with you. Um, we also just kind of wanted to remind you that we do have a working group of our advisory council that focuses on this, and that has been the planning group for these meetings, um, and so that's been one of their main functions. But more importantly, um, we use the meetings as a tool for helping them and others uh, to provide guidance to us uh, in areas of genomic medicine implementation, such as, you know, what are the needs for infrastructure to make this happen? Uh, what are related efforts that might be related to, to future collaborations, such as we're doing today? Um, and in general, kind of reviewing progress in, in implementation and, and identifying next steps. Uh, this is the, the group, and almost all of them are here today. Uh, Jim Evans couldn't be with us. Dan Roden, actually, we sent to a, a meeting in Brussels to represent uh, the group at a, uh, an, a European Science Foundation um, uh, meeting that was about implementing genomic medicine, and, and Jeff may touch on that a little bit in, in what he'll be talking about. Uh, we also established a, a social networking site kind of as an experiment uh, following our May meeting. There, there seemed to be some interest in doing this, although uh, we didn't have it up and running by May because so, it came out of that meeting. And so I'm not sure that it's as, as well known. And we, we thought it might be a nice place for uh, if people have questions to each other uh, among the, the various institutes or, or centers that are doing this kind of work, um, you know, how, how do you deal with uh, an incidental finding of a BRCA1 variant of unknown significance or, you know, some, something along those lines to, to be able to share those and kind of bat them back and forth. And this was an experiment for us. Uh, there's not a lot on it now, but we would encourage you to, to go to it and, and uh, see and give us advice on how we can make it more useful. Uh, this is something, as, this Citable is, is uh, um, actually a service provided by nature uh, and it's free and, and very easy to use, so, so we thought we would try it. Uh, we also held a, held a workshop in September um, about uh, implicating sequence variants that several of you were involved in, uh, and the goal was to develop guidelines for assessing, or at least guidance for assessing, the evidence implicating sequence variants or um, genes in, as, as being causal in a specific disease. This is a big issue. Um, uh, very, very often you'll see publications saying, oh, this is it, this is the, the, you know, the variant or the gene that causes X disease, and then you know, months or years later you'll see uh, uh, subsequent publications disproving that. And, and so this was kind of the, the uh, um, area of confusion that we were trying to address. And there is a manuscript in preparation from that we hope to have out very soon. 
Um, Another thing that we've been doing is collecting recent advances, uh, you know, uh, publications and other announcements that seem to us to be um, sort of hallmarks of what this field can do for medicine and the public in general. Obviously, we, we find this very useful for um, explaining to the public and Congress and to others you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and we suspect it's probably would, would be a useful thing for others of you when people say, well, you know, what in this is, has made a difference in, in patient care? And so, so some that we have identified, I include this uh, whole genome sequencing in a, in a fetus, which is done um, through maternal serum rather than through amniocentesis, and, and now is largely re replacing amniocentesis in, a, in uh, most cases, then followed up by a, a confirmatory amnio when necessary. Um, this was uh, uh, an episode at, or several episodes actually at the NIH Clinical Center, um, trying to determine how this Klebsiella that came to us from a patient from uh, New York actually continued to spread even though every possible effort was, was made to, to eradicate the organism and to sterilize the staff. And it ended up, it was, I think it was growing in the drain pipe of one of the sinks or something. And, and, and using sequencing enabled uh, folks to be able to trace this and, and how it was transmitted from, from patient to patient. Um, uh, this was a, uh, another uh, advance using whole genome sequencing in neonatal intensive care units for, for uh, uh, newborns with severe uh, disorders. Uh, and this uh, very recent one in New England Journal uh, looking at this, the PIK3CA mutation uh, in relation to aspirin use and, and colon cancer survival. So, so these are just examples of things that we're trying to collect. And if you have uh, an example of something that's really pretty close to ready to, for implementation, this one may be a, a little bit further, but maybe not, um, or that, that demonstrates an example of implementation, it would be very helpful if you would send those to us. Uh, Ian Murpuri is the, the person that's collecting them, or you can send them to me. And we'll, uh, we'll try to get them up on our, our website. And that's, that's uh, down here, the, these numbers, but it, at least the genomic medicine website of uh, of NHGRI. Um, mention was made of the first um, uh, meeting that we held in June 2011. We finally have a paper out on that. It took longer than, than I would have liked, and my apologies for that, but at any rate. Um, and the, the purpose there was to, to kind of collect what the ongoing uh, projects were and the challenges that they had encountered, uh, identify some common infrastructural and research needs, and then uh, outline an implementation framework for other groups that might want to apply this kind of work. So that's now available through uh, in genomics and medicine. Uh, and this just uh, briefly summarizes what we've, we've done, defining the landscape and identifying commonalities and then developing the roadmap in the first uh, meeting. We didn't call it GM1, just as they didn't call the First World War, World War I, because there hadn't been a World War II. Uh, but at any rate, uh, and then, the, so that was the colloquium. And then we followed it with uh, GM2 in December, um, where we were looking at potential collaborative projects and developing um, uh, some working groups around those. Uh, and then we also spent some time with institutional leaders actually asking, them, what does it take at your institution to, to make this a reality? Uh, and, and got some very interesting insights from them that I won't uh, review here because we've reviewed them at previous meetings. Uh, but that uh, meeting is, is uh, on our web. We, we've videotaped uh, or videocast and, and taped and archived uh, these meetings since the first one. So. Um, and then the third one in Chicago uh, looked at the pilot project working groups and um, um, spent a fair amount of time with payers and other stakeholders uh, looking at uh, uh, what some of the barriers were. And that then led to the payers meeting last time, um, which Derek, uh, or in October, which Derek has described to you. And then, of course, our meeting here uh, really focusing on professional societies. So, so that's kind of the, the landscape here. What, you know, we, the way Rex has summarized it is, you know, the first meeting we said there's significant action in genomic medicine. Uh, in the second, we recognize that healthcare providers care about um, genomic medicine. And the third, that those who pay for healthcare care about it, and that professional organisms and physicians care about it. So, um, so we're we're moving along, which uh, we're very excited about. Um, we were a little concerned when we started these meetings that we'd get into meeting hell. I'm a big Gary Larson fan, and here you see this guy getting coffee. Oh man, the coffee's cold. They thought of everything. Thing. Um, and hopefully we have, we have at least avoided that small problem, if not, uh, if not others. Um, but, uh, but we feel it is worth it to, to get this group together, uh, not only because of what goes on in the main session, but also what goes on in the breaks and the uh, uh, side meetings and that. Um, another important thing uh, we feel that has come out of this are, are a variety of funding opportunities that we've developed based on the input that we've gotten from this community and the needs um, uh, for research. Uh, and so the, uh, I'll talk about each of these. There's the, the pilot demonstration projects uh, RFA, the clinically relevant uh, variance resource that Aaron described yesterday, uh, a newborn uh, sequencing uh, effort that we're doing with NICHD. Um, and just to, to focus on the, the pilot demonstration projects, we have two RFAs um, out for 
for this for a coordinating center and for clinical sites. The purpose is to demonstrate the feasibility of and, and develop methods for incorporating patients' genomic findings into their clinical care, particularly expanding efforts and developing new projects and methods in diverse clinical settings as well as diverse populations. Uh, so not just at tertiary care centers, but, uh, but you know, in, in a variety of places. Uh, contributing to the evidence base uh, to the degree that's possible and defining and disseminating the, the processes of this implementation uh, in diverse settings. Um, applications were received in July. The review uh, has already occurred. My colleagues Ebony and Heather are here, um, and uh, uh, unfortunately they can't answer much in the way of questions on this. Another Gary Larson, uh, yes, I believe there's a question here in the back. So they can tell you sort of what's publicly obvious, um, but beyond that they really can't, can't comment much, and that's uh, you know, our apologies, but stay tuned. We, we hope to be able to announce those awards fairly soon. Uh, the clinically relevant variance resource uh, that Aaron described, uh, I won't uh, you know, belabor this, but, uh, but these were the, the purposes of it, developing a resource uh, that, that could provide um, uh, information for professional societies like yours to base their guideline development process on, uh, and also try to build on some of the existing programs in this area. Um, and those applications were received in October. The review is coming up. Erin, uh, you've heard from, and again, she can't say much more than, yes, it's a cow, um, so stay tuned to that. All right, um, the clinical sequencing exploratory research was two RFAs that were actually a, a um, repeat issuance of an RFA that was issued uh, back in 2010, I believe, uh, that began the clinical sequencing exploratory research, or CSER consortium. Uh, there was a, a fair amount of, of demand um, and need at that point to, to expand uh, that uh, consortium, and so we're, we're making an effort to do that through this. Um, at the, point, the, the purpose is to investigate challenges to applying actual sequence data in the care of patients. Um, um, and the, the uh, goals would be to generate uh, genomic sequence data that can be used in, in a clinical uh, care and, and that would be relevant to an individual patient, then uh, translate these data for the physician and communicate them to the patient uh, and examine the ethical and psychosocial implications of, of doing that. Um, so so a, a fairly ambitious agenda for that program. Uh, applications received in the summer. The review was, was uh, partially carried out in October, was interrupted by Hurricane Sandy, and so was uh, um, continued in January. Uh, Lucia and Brad are, are both here, and again, uh, you'll need to stay tuned on that. Uh, and then the genomic sequencing and newborn screening disorders uh, RFA is something that we're doing in, in collaboration with the Child Health and Human Development um, uh, Institute. Uh, the goals were to explore possible uses of genome sequence information in the newborn period, um, and these are the goals here, um, acquiring these data sets uh, in the newborn period, um, try to understand specific disorders uh, that might be identifiable using sequence data uh, through, through newborn screening, um, and examine the, the LC implications of doing that. Uh, and uh, applications have just been received. The review is coming up. Anastasia was unable to be here, um, and she will um, um, be having, having more information on that uh, in the future. So. Um, we also, uh, as I believe is an outcome of the second meeting, or maybe even the first, um, developed a, a, a fairly concerted effort in pharmacogenomics that I'm not going to describe now because Josh Denny actually is going to describe it uh, um, in, a, in a moment, but just to, just to point out that we are working with the Pharmacogenomics Research Network and in eMERGE, uh, and I won't, won't go through this, but do have a nice um, uh, graphic here that, that describes that using this as sort of the, the, the uh, basic foundational research, um, we're, we're sort of taking a state-of-the-art array um, and then passing it down to eMERGE, which is, is kind of the implementation arm, uh, which has less pharmacogenomic-focused labs, a large patient base, and electronic phenotyping, phenotyping and can address some of the privacy concerns, et cetera, and find out you know, how, how effective and practical this is in, in clinical care. So I think I'll stop at this point and be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Oh, my goodness. Obviously, it was perfectly clear. Stunned into silence. It was a cow. It was a cow. <laughs> Say what? It was a cow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. if you have questions, uh, um, uh, feel free to uh, attack Terry at the break. All right. I think we have now um, uh, report outs from a couple of the different um, uh, work groups. Uh, so first will be periodontal microbiome.